Ja, bloed Ja. Nu is accidental. Coincidental. Hi guys, thanks for joining. This is Essence of Medicine. I'm Amanda Armagost. I'm Melissa Haber. And I'm Dr. Bossi, and it is both Essence of Medicine and Essence of History. Now, what are we going to talk about, Amanda? Well, today we're going to be rem remembering your childhood hero. Do you want to say who it is? I, well, I like to first say why he's my childhood hero. I'm, I'm born about... Uh, 10 years before the Islamic revolution in Iran. And before the revolution, we got everything you get here, you got here at that time, like um, I used to see you know, Sesame Streets and Aquaman and Batman and so on. And we were like glued to the TV when mm -hmm. we were doing that. After the Islamic revolution, lots of this American TV and so on went away. And we didn't really saw same shows and so on. And we were limited to the shows that are from the East Bloc, like, you know, like a Eastern Bloc, like those countries like Poland and so on and so forth. So the TV in Iran was very limited, but that little TV that was out there, it was very interesting. So meaning that even that that bad revolution, bad situation for the people, war and so on, it had something. We watched lots of documentaries and lots of stories, lots of um, practically life stories of lots of people that you guys don't grow up here. Do you know who some of them are? Like nope. Marie Curie. You don't know them, do you know? <laughs> Marie Curie, like uh, Ramon I Cajal, mm -hmm. like, you know, like uh, Mendeleev, like uh, Dostoevsky, like, and including in that things that we used to watch, and this, that was all what's in the TV, was Ignaz Semmelweis. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I remember still those TVs because as a child, you're like a sponge. You mm -hmm. remember things, you absorb things. And uh, there are a few people I was really absorbed in their life stories. And Semmelweis, was one of them. I couldn't pinpoint as a child why I was so fascinated by his story. And uh, But now, almost uh, 45 years later, I, I know why I was fascinated with his story. Ignaz Semmelweis, the title of our podcast today is Remember Ignaz Semmelweis. So, um, before we even go to his life, Ignaz Semmelweis, we have to talk about theories in medicine. Like, I mean, everybody has heard of Hippocratic I, uh, I, uh, oath. oath, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what is a Hippocratic Oath? It's the oath that all doctors have to take. Before. Not really. That, we don't really take that oh. oath. It's integrated in the laws and rules and regulation. But the it is, is a, said, is it not? Huh? Don't you have to say the oath? No, I never said the oath. It's, we don't take oath anymore. We I had to take through. an oath before I graduated. Really? The, wow. There was a physician assistant oath that I had, no we had kidding. to read at our graduation. Well, we have to sign a lot of documents. But, <laughs> That's probably on there. Yeah, well, not really. We have much farther. No, Hippocratic oath. Do, do you know how old that is? Old? Like what? How? Like 1600s. 1,500 BC. No, it is about 2,300 years old. So? It's old. 2,300 years old. So we have better BC things. Ish. Yeah, about. That wasn't too far no, off. No, you weren't. You weren't. But we have better things than things that are 2,300 years old to perform what we are doing. Right. I we don't understand. rely on things that are too. As a matter of fact, one of their advantages and one of the impediment in medicine and in science has been that old Greek philosopher, they put ideas in place, concept in place. And first in Renaissance, after we shut them off, that is when we could grow. Like 
there were this idea of elements that there were four elements wind fire, uh, fire air, water. air and water yeah. for a long time that was the concept of existence and we had to go through tremendous amount of discovery pain and suffering until we shed it off do you know what that four element come from from aristotle mm. aristotle it was a big figure but the problem was that in 16th and 17th century we were still working on aristotelian concept of existence same thing with medicine we were still working on hippocrates idea of bodily humors mm -hmm. you know what they are the bodily humor give me the first one blood oh, okay no I was... black bile yellow bile and phlegm we thought everything in our body works based on those four humors okay okay that humoralism was the concept of medicine you would be surprised oh, I'm until surprised. in pastor meaning in toward the end of the 18th um, 17th century, toward the end of 17th century, we thought the malaise, have you heard the word malaise, mm -hmm. right? Do you know what that means? Bad air. Yeah. It means bad air. We thought this humor in our body, that the imbalance of this humor in your body that makes you sick. Mm -hmm. Like black bile, you're more black bile than yellow bile or blood and so on and that is that here comes when you understand that you have to understand that you are to know why in 17 and 18th century there are so many for so many diseases they would let blood mm -hmm. literally they would cut you and let you take blood from you because they thought that in that humorism the blood is too much compared to other and that is why they let blood and, and so they they had the idea that our body has like homeostasis that there's a balance they just didn't grasp exactly how yeah. to balance that no, yeah. what needs to be balanced and the, the actually scary part is that wasn't until 200 years ago or so that we shed that off well even didn't they do that with george washington they did it with george washington in 17 something something or 18 something something. I mean, mm -hmm. until Louis Pasteur toward the second half of this 18, uh, second half of the 17th century is where we, we found out about the germ theory. Mm -hmm. Until then, we just thought it's a bad air. It's a disbalance between the, this uh, disbalance between these uh, humors that makes you sick. Mm -hmm. And Ignaz Semmelweis was born to that concept of medicine okay so you did some research what did why don't you tell us you both of you tell us what did you find out about Ignaz? oh Semmelweis? i found out that he was born in 1818 exactly 100 years before the end of this first world war and that is important see why you is it important something. well you're gonna tell me <laughs> because he was born after the second first world war the austrian hungarian empire fell apart but 1818 was the the top highest point or that that era era of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Okay. They were the center of civilized universe. The best philosophers, the best uh, poets, the best uh, composers, the best medical knowledge was in in their place. And you know what their um, the capital was. Of Hungary? Austria, Hungarian oh. Empire, hmm. Vienna. Oh. Okay. okay. So um, Zemmelweis was not born in Vienna, but everybody who wanted to be something or somebody did go to Vienna. Zemmelweis was born, in, you guys know where he was born? No, well, no, I just know he was born in Hungary. In Hungary, in Budapest. Um, I, you know, I hope one day I can take you both to Budapest. It is the most romantic, beautiful city. It is on a river Danube, which is by itself is an unbelievable place. But on one side was the Buddha, on the other side the Pest, and then they came together. Hence, they were the city of Budapest. Mm -hmm. It is that that's the most beautiful 
architecture. And it's a, it was city of romantic after Heidelberg. Heidelberg used to be a city of romantic in, um, in, in, in Europe where I go, mm -hmm. did go to med school. And then after that, the Prague and Budapest fighting which one is going to be <laughs> the overhand. And both of them are very beautiful cities. He was born there. But and um, and but the name Zemmelweis is a very German name. I, I would Zemmel? agree. <laughs> Weiss I... means white, and Zemmel is actually there are many different versions of it. But it's it can be like a um, like a the, the kind of bread is called Zemmel. Mm, okay. Okay. So um, uh, we call it Zemmel. At least in southern Germany, we call it Zemmel. Um, and so he was born there to more or less a middle-class aristocratic family. And as they do, they educate their children in certain field. And uh, those fields are like law or medicine. Hmm. So yeah, I'm not surprised that he started first with law before he went to medicine. Yeah. He went to law, said, nope, not for me, went to medicine. So what else did you find out about him? I don't want to have a monologue here. Tell me about he, what you all know about his life and did you find anything else interesting from his childhood? I didn't really do much research personally on his mm -hmm. childhood. I think Charlie might have. Most of what I was learning about was more in the future, which we'll right. get to what more he's about. Known for. Yeah, and what he's known for and kind of like the mark that he made and why. Why it he was wasn't, a rebel. Yeah. He was a rebel, true and true. And uh, he was a troublemaker. It's all making he was, sense now. No wonder he likes him. Of course. And, and what you need to know, again, it's important about where he was. He was in the, he was in the center of the academic universe. In, in the Austro-Hungarian, in the capital of Austro-Hungarian empire. The place, that was the place to be. That is, there was the place to learn. That is, was the place to be progressive because compared to that, everything was backward. And it, you know, like that, uh, practically compared to that place, everybody else was provincial. So he goes through the med school and everything. Well, did you want to say anything interesting about his childhood? I think I did, that he was a he rebel. Was a rebel. That, was a, that he wasn't, you know, he was, um, from early on in his school, he wasn't like many other, you know, high intellectual people. He 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 was not the part of the crew. He wasn't like he was part of the ball. clique. He's the oddball throughout. Seems to and be that's kind not of a, unusual. a theme when it yeah, comes to Einstein too. Yeah, mm -hmm. those, yeah. those that make a mark on the world tend so, to have. I like what you just said. Those who make a mark on the world. They're oddballs. Yeah, I'm not surprised about that at no. all. No, it makes sense. So now he goes to med school. And at that time, those theories of humoralism is still in place. We understand nothing about the human body. We barely understand what the pulse is and how it works or and so on. Vital sign, nothing about that germ theory. What's that? Hmm. And uh, he wanted to become a, what a good doctor always wanted to be, an internal medicine. <laughs> that is what he wanted to be. But he's too odd for that. So he get pushed to something less um, prominent. And that is OBGYN or no. gynecology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which I nice. thought I don't know when I was doing my research I thought that I read that there weren't that many doctors in OBGYN it was mostly like midwives, midwives and nurses and he was that is good doctors wanted to be internal yeah, medicine they wanted to... surgeons weren't high up at all mm. because every time they touched anybody the patient they died. died they were like barbers barbers were surgeons internal mm. medicine is like balancing fluids in the body and so on. Those were the real doctors. Everybody else was, eh. So wasn't that hmm. even more odd that he was in an OBGYN, like a, a doctor? He, not he a, didn't a have man. any other choice. Didn't they call them man man nurses or something? Like no, that? no, it were doctors. No, I heard when I was doing my podcast that there, there were the female midwives 
and then there were mm. male versions of the midwives, but they were called mm-hmm. something else. So they no, were probably made, you know, like you said, they were they didn't have that high class respect that yeah. other doctors would. So they probably did get those, you know, no, but male nurse, yeah. you know. No, no, but they weren't as well doctors, but that's important because there were midwives, mm-hmm. mostly nuns. Oh, sure. And in, as a matter of fact, in German, the word for nurse is sister, nurse, schwester. Hmm. That because that they were Catholic nuns usually or nuns, but they were midwives, and that's important. I'm going to come back to that. And then there were doctors who just, they just didn't get the internal is medicine. It, is spot. it fair to say at this point all doctors were males? Yeah, it okay. is very fair to say all doctors were males. Right. There were no female doctor at that time. Right. In many countries, you couldn't even go to university. Mm-hmm. If you're a woman or read or write, I'm thinking. Well, no, yeah, yeah, well, you know, you could read and write, but you couldn't become a have an academic position as a wife, uh, as a woman. So, so he get pushed to this um, lower position doctor, and he's in a in a community hospital, and like all the community hospitals, they have these wards that doctors run, and you have to pay. And they have this ward that is the charity, church runs it, midwives run it, mm. and then um, they get take care of more, take care of the poor people and so on. Mm. Yeah, is there anything odd about that so far? Well, no? it seems a little bit imbalanced. Yeah, it is imbalanced. If we're thinking of the time, yeah. the time and place. I mean, that's that, none of this is surprising to me at all. Yeah. Um, I also went to school at a catholic nun-based school mm-hmm. so i understand the midwife nursing of the 1800s surprisingly so let's, yeah. let's put you back in 1800 you're about to give birth to heart delivery because not even everybody went to hospital for this you're you going there to the hospital which hospital would you go i would go to the the Causes. money-based one with doctors and who you well, of course, I would of be, course, yeah. To, to that where right. you have to pay for the doctors and not midwives are in charge, yeah. right? I think isn't the midwife though even a step up from what was the standard, which was having birth in your home? Yeah, yes. yeah, that yeah. is yeah. that is. I think you know they had different level of midwives and so on, but yeah, they had home birth, hospital midwife, hospital highest level, mm-hmm. uh, doctors. But here becomes interesting. The reputation was already established. People would beg to go to midwife place and not to the doctor's hospital. Do you know why? From every three per woman who was admitted to the hospital, died. one of them died. They died infections. Mm-hmm. From every, imagine, 30% mortality. Every third woman at the same time in the midwife section, mm-hmm. only two about two to five percent would die, but in the doctor's place, 30 percent would die, and even with the best effort, that number was around 16 to 20 percent would die. So that that was already established. Mm-hmm. Woman would go there and beg to be admitted. The p- patient knew that, would beg to be admitted to the midwife section. Hmm. Hmm. That is when the woman who can afford everything, the hospital want to put them there so they pay and they have the money. That's not a pro issue. And they beg to be admitted to the cheap section. What does that tell us? That the cheap section is doing something right. Mm-hmm. And the expensive section is doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. And people know it. Mm-hmm. Their reputation is already established. There is nothing unknown about that. So if women know that, the doctor would have known that. Um, do you think it really bothered any of those doctors or chair of the department and so on? Do you think it bothered them? Doesn't sound nope. like it. Doesn't really sound like it. Because they were probably still having business regardless. Well, they got to make Babies money. were still being had. So, so Semmelweis, it does, it did bother Semmelweis. And that is where my fascination with him come. He just doesn't accept that. He doesn't accept that every third woman should die mm-hmm. during the birth process. And they didn't die right away. They, they, gave, they gave delivered the baby and so on. And then 
um, they, you know, start having it, what we call we would call today infection, mm -hmm. and then they would die. And those doctors treated them with humoral kind of thing. They let blood. They were already bleeding, you know, bleeding from birth. They let blood. <laughs> so. Almost nobody who got to that point made it. And that was so Do when they saw that the air was dirty and stuff. They like thought that. it's the air. Yeah. And, you know, and that they thought it's a humoral imbalance and malaise, air and so on and so forth. And and that was the status Zemmelweis come and say, you know, what is the difference? Why so many better? Is it because we are crowded here? No, the midwife section was crowded more. Mm -hmm. Do they, they have less resources, they have things and so on. And what is really the difference? They are not even far away. It's not for God's sake, it's not the air. They are in the same building. It's not the air. It's not so the cleaning people. You know? Well, if it was any cleaning, but what is it? What is it? Midwives versus doctors. And what is that? Oh, and another thing that he discovered is that all those women who died, they went for dissection in the morning because in the morning they would do dissection with the student. And in the noon afternoon, they would come and examine the patient. And I mean, if you think about the humoral kind of concept, it makes sense. They didn't bother really wash their hands. No. That is, so uh, we cannot wrap our head around that today, but that they're, they were gentlemen. What, you're telling a gentleman hand can transfer, be dirty, yeah. be dirty and transfer disease and so on? Are you insulting me? Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that my hand, I'm a gentleman, transfers something that makes this woman sick? You are a crazy person, Semmelweis. Right, especially, we all know you can't see it. Right, so try convincing somebody that has to imagine these, I, like if I were trying to explain to a child right now, like, oh, you got little germs on your hands that can make you sick you know it seems almost crazy to yeah. talk out loud so, let well, alone we do teach children now so adults can right I, although I think like one in five people still don't wash their hands after using the restroom it's we've it's a really... had this conversation and I believe that's because we need to teach men that just because they go pee, they still need to wash their That's hands. That's a huge thing, actually. Yeah, it's a huge thing. But I'm talking about going from cadaver to, to examining a patient. Well, and we're talking about having all the information in front of you. And, and still, still ignoring it. Still doing it. Not. Still ignoring so these it. People, these people, ignorance is bliss. These people are, the ones we're referring to, are, are choosing ignorance. Right. Those yeah. doctors, they didn't know yet. Okay, but the evidence were out there, though. The evidence were for everybody to see. Women knew that. They would beg, literally beg not to go to that hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So patient knew that. Everybody knew that. But the establishment, the medical establishment, it, was, it wasn't there. They were lacking any evidence. They knew how much patient are they are dying in their ward versus the, the midwife section. And yet, they all ignored that. And when Zemmelweis start advocating, you know, to wash your hand after that cadaver dissection before you go there, mm -hmm. what do you think what the reaction of the medical establishment not was? Not good. Yeah, probably not. He was radical. He was yeah, laughed he off. Get fired. No, he get did him get out of here. He oh, actually did man. get fired eventually. Oh, let's he, that. So. It's a pattern. Anytime you try and go against the establishment, they kind of get upset in history. Yeah. And so <laughs> he was sent back from Vienna mm. to back office or back place, which was the Budapest compared to Vienna. So his boss is actually a major phrase from his boss telling them, telling Semmelweis, literally telling Semmelweis, Stick to what is known and what's tradition. Mm -hmm. It's not your place to 
you know, move the establishment, I'm paraphrasing, or bring up new ideas is not your place. Mm -hmm. That while women were dying in that, in his world, you know, nature is, universe is karma is to a point real. One of those biggest, one of his biggest opponent cut himself during the dissection with a scalpel and he died of purpural fever, which is infection. Cross-contamination too, yes. I mean. And, yeah, and so that is the sad story, but a few, actually about a few years after Zemmelweis' death, the pastor um, introduced the theory of germs, that there are things you don't see that can transfer the disease from those people who literally you killed with your, with your not washing your hand, you get the bacteria from them and you then bring it back. And then the cycle goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Even after he did it everywhere, Zimmelweis went and he enforced that project, washing your hand, the rate, death rate dropped like to one tenth of what it was. One tenth. Hmm. Do you need any more evidence? That was not enough. Do you see, if you care anything about the people and you listen to Zimmelweis history, how you're captured, your heart is almost being squeezed, you know, at the ignorance, you know, that people, why people are dying and there's no lack of evidence. Patients know that. They come and beg not to go there. And in every place he went, the rate of death dropped one-tenth, mm. lower than the maternity leave, uh, maternity ward run by midwives and so on. And yet people tell him, stick to what's out there and don't move forward. Do, do not, it's not your place mm -hmm. to fight the establishment. And he paid the price. He was fired. He wasn't promoted. He was sent to backward. And even then he went on the street. He went on the street and asked the woman to, to ask their doctor to wash their hands. He, yeah, did, he did what, his own public marketing campaign. He did his own public marketing campaign. Any similarities with what we do? I've been thinking about what we do this whole time. Yeah, yeah. What, what is, what is, you know? So, what, what comes to your mind? I mean, when you think about Zemmelweis history, well, <sighs> my first thought is because, like, of course, there's a lot of correlations for people that follow along with us and our stories and kind of what you're saying. You know, from what I've heard, there are a lot of studies that. W inspired spine themselves have put out to show, you know, infection rates, the BMI controls, all these different mm -hmm. things that we've had, you know, with Olaf specifically, and you go and you show it and we put it out there and everybody just says the same thing. Well, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. You yeah. know, I mean, that's um, fine. I mean, you do what you're works. doing, but I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I was in Seattle. I was mm -hmm. in a conference and I showed them my data. Mm -hmm. And I showed them that uh, my rate of infection is 0 0.2. And I showed that to people whose rate of infection is 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. I showed that to them. And when I was there, Zimmelweis in the back of my mind, because I saw the smirk on mm -hmm. the corner of their this mouths. <laughs> I saw the ridicule in the corner. They wouldn't express that. We were on camera. But they would ask a question. They would, you know, like um, one of them. I want there was talking to them. You notice that they get together, that separate themselves, and one of them hesitate for for a fraction of a second to shake my hand. So yeah, that is so rude. No, but li listen, I don't take that personally. No, you don't take that. I know you don't but, take that personally, but like it's not really about how you're taking it. Yeah. Other people see that behavior as well. Yeah, and. I just think that's really embarrassing. Not a, it's not embarrassing for you. It's embarrassing for them. For medical community. To, but yeah, but this is not aware new. of it. But but and but to this openly is... say I would rather not put in the effort to learn these new things or take accountability. You know, it's it's exactly what we were just saying. Like, well, why would I wash my hands? That's more but, work for me to do. But do yeah. you see do you see that thing there? Our risk of infection is 115 to 125th mm -hmm. of open traditional spine surgery, mm -hmm. okay? It's 115 to 125th. 
I put it out there, those people who have 10% risk of infection, 5% risk of infection, they have to smirk on the corner of their mouth, but that behavior is not new. That is why right. Semmelweis, at 45 years later, I know why my, I have this fascination with his wife and with his life and so on. Now, his story is tragic though. Semmelweis' story is tragic. You can imagine what happened next. Well, I, yeah. He became a recluse or? He well, became, I, he drove, I, he, he went mad. I say people probably wouldn't talk to him. He wasn't accepted yeah. into the civilization. Medical community, the medical community. They shunned didn't. him probably. For, they did. They this did. Is, this is such a story. You can put almost any huge inventor or innovator or something in this same shoes. Like Einstein was similar. Anybody, Tesla. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like anybody that questions yeah. the norm, just in general, you know, it doesn't have to be high invention. So, you know laws are changing very rapidly nowadays and we see that a lot just with acceptance and you know this is this is not what it was at one point but this is what it is now you need to you know accept it roll with it go with it or else you're just as good as you as they were back then so um let me tell you a few things about that this Zemmelweis Mm -hmm. and you know it's a few hundred years later and people has not changed People are the same people. They they stick to a concept. And if something comes and rattles that concept, they move that concept too Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. It is a vast majority of the people don't want to even look at that. So people people have not changed. People have not changed. But um, nobody remembers any of those people who gave Semmelweis a hard time. (laughs) Nobody remembers them. There you go. Everybody remembers Semmelweis. But do you know how many people had to die until that was accepted? How many people had I to die? I don't even want to try and do that math. That is sad. You know how many three? You know how many people are giving birth every they say every three minutes or something like that? Well, every second. I don't know. Crazy yeah. amounts. And how then many, you put that fraction like one yeah. every ten minutes, then nine. How many children grew A up lot. without their mother? A lot. Because of that ignorant, that callousness of being academic, but closing your eyes, that um, that cannot be forgiven. That just cannot be forgiven. The callousness about the human suffering, that all the evidences are in front of you, but you are too good to look at them and take consequences, take hard consequences. And that the, you, you, and, you know, if you have a question, go try it out. You're mm-hmm. academic for that reason. Semmelweis was driven mad. He was ostracized. Nobody, everybody ready, literally ridiculed him and laughed him off. And he was admitted to mental asylum. Is and that where he died? When he was 47, 48, he had the altercation with one of the wardens, one of the guards in the mental asylum. He cut himself. And he got an infection from that, and he died of sepsis mm. in the, at the age of 47. Now I'm just trying to think of, you know, you explained medicine and how they treated them before. Now I'm thinking how they treated the, the patients and patients. the psych patients. I already know some of the things that they would do, but I'm just thinking back to the, you know, the cutting or the bleeding, you know, you're, you're a little crazy today. Here, let's drain some blood. We know what happens when you start to become depleted in those things that clearly it's just going to make everything a lot yeah. worse. So it just gets my mind thinking and I don't like to think about it. No, the tragedy of Semmelweis uh, life is a human tragedy, but as well a triumph right. of human, um, of the humanity that, uh, and I can go on and on and I can uh, talk about lots of other people who have truly made a mark in human history, in human life, in medicine, that they had similar um, similar experience. And, you know, and I truly feel some of that responsibility now. And what a burden, what a burden to know that you are experiencing what Zemmelweis or Ramon Kaka or Marie Curie experienced hundreds and hundreds of years ago. What a burden to you know, st- still stand up every morning and go back to do what you do best, to say, 
I'm still here. You know what, what Raman Kohol did or, the, the, uh, or Semmelweis did not have? They did not have Amanda and <laughs> Alyssa to go directly. To, they did not have social media. They did not have a podcast to talk about it. Literally, mm -hmm. Semmelweis went on the street, talked to a woman on the street. Now, imagine I would go to the downtown and I start talking to a woman about Ask your doctor, wash their hand. I do that all the time, actually. Yeah. I see stuff like, camp, don't you see campaigns like that on TikTok? Like people oh, going to sign. There's signs you remember? in the bathrooms that say, make sure the employees wash their hands. So and I, I think know. those are so embarrassing. I know. Every time I see those, I'm like, if it hey, works, not just for employees, everyone. Do you remember when we went to front of a club and I was making a video about. That is such don't, a different story. Well. I was saying judging people for their outfits. No, is such a I was saying put something on so you don't have hypothermia. Yeah, he's worried about them being cold. Okay, and was in okay. January, people walking almost naked from the clubs and so on. And actually, you encouraged me to do that, and I got lots of. They, they, they were telling that I'm no, cat calling and so on. Yes, you did, you guys. Yeah. I would not even. <laughs> so either way, so. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go on the street. Yeah, like we have better tools today <laughs> than uh, 200 years ago about you know, educating our patients. And that's what, what's about, mm -hmm. okay? Remember Semmelweis. It's a tragedy and a triumph at the same time. And uh, I think what uh, we need to know is that that experience wasn't the first one. Mm -hmm. It's not the last. It's not the last. And it's ongoing. In 2023, we have the same experiences that uh, the people are laughing off through innovation and through changes. And there is still that callousness regarding human suffering. We should do we should do a podcast sometime of like a speed round of different people that were basically like laughed off, and then later their ideas were accepted. Oh, that would be a good round. That would be an interesting name. Me. I was thinking more. Try to pronounce their names on live. I know. I'm like, do you want to say who your childhood yeah, hero who, was? Who is this guy we're talking about today? Let me tell you about uh, something that you probably have heard from me at least at nausea multiple times. Do you know why we are able to use this technology to do what we are doing? Because we understand how electrons behave in certain situations. How electronic works, computers, microphone, internet, all of that. All of that is based on the quantum theory. Mm. The father of the quantum theory, Max Planck, said a new idea doesn't ever get accepted because academic jump on it and recognize the true value of it. Mm. It comes through one inspired person not giving up and moving it forward. And uh, I'm not paraphrasing now. And the old thoughts die and the new mm -hmm. generation accept the new ideas. And his major phrase was, the science improves one funeral at the time when the old mm -hmm. culture dies and new thing. And the word inspire in that phrase, to use that word, that's where inspired spine comes mm -hmm. from. So, um, so, uh, but again, you know, I feel how they felt in their lifetime because I feel that You're pressure. Going through it now. I'm going through that pressure now. And you've been I going see, through that I, pressure I, for years, but at different and years and different levels, different, reasons, for sure. different levels, different people, Just, different yeah. naysayers, and different supporters. Do um, we think it's going to slow down? No, I nope. doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. But you know, it just uh, they. Um, that is why we are doing it because mm -hmm. it does make it different in people's in patients' life. Absolutely, every day, sure. every day. We see it. If you have been told you have to live with the pain, and you say, "I don't want to live with this pain. I want to die," you come to us and we do a one-hour surgery. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you go and regain your life. And every one patient whose life got regained, it's like actually three or four people's lives got regained because that patient's family. Oh, absolutely. So much easier. That's what I was thinking about all these moms that are passing away. It's not just the child now living that without doesn't the mother. Have, yeah. yeah. Now it's right. the husband without a wife. It's 
so many people are lost their yeah. daughter, you know, right. their parents trying to take care. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a very good point that you say, you know, Dr. Bossi will probably point on this. Our patients typically, they don't come alone because they kind they of need can't it. anymore. Mm-hmm. Most of the time they're to the point where they kind of rely on somebody else to take care of them to some extent, not always that, but mm-hmm. so when you say regaining their lives back, you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of a weight lifted off of their family's yeah. shoulders as well. So yeah. no, do we, for what we do, do we lack evidence? Do we have Absolutely any not. lack of evidence <laughs> of what Absolutely we are doing? Absolutely not. No way. So we have over 1,200 patient testimonial at different stage. We have the result of those infection rates that mm-hmm. we have versus open surgery and so on. We have all of that. Mm-hmm. And yet the smirk on the corner of I still this. think about that Colorado conference when that doctor was trying, I'm not going to say his name. He was challenging you so much on the stage, but he had to give you a check because you did a presentation. <laughs> and oh. so he, after all this challenging and fighting on the stage, he comes up and like, th- like throws the check at him. <laughs> Take your money. <laughs> yeah. Like, because fine. he invited me to go there and so on. So, but, <laughs> but the idea here is the same that uh, the the true changes are not easily accepted. One of the questions is to ask to me is that, why aren't there everybody's doing that? Why is not, if this is so good, if it's so much better, why isn't everybody else is doing that? And my nice answer to that is that those doctors are busy to go there and go educate, Mm -hmm. learn, train, go more back to school and learn that and so on. Yeah, that's definitely a nice way of putting it. Yeah, but that's unconscionable to know that being being faced with the evidence and refuse to look at it. That's unconscionable. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're refusing to look at it because of um, benefits that you're getting for doing something else. Now, and again, it all comes back to history of Semmelweis. Remember? I do have one one point that you said, because my family asks a lot of questions when I go home about what we do. And I tell them, you know, oh, yeah, our our surgeries are, you know, shorter, this and that. And they had said, well, don't you get paid more if you're in the operating room longer? You know, don't you get paid more for longer surgeries? I just had to laugh because I've never been one for the money. I always tell people, keep me out of that. So it's not surprising that everyone's first thought is, well, what about the money? Don't you lose money when you create shorter surgeries don't you lose money when you do this and it's just you know that's kind of the thought that a lot of other people have too it's about the money it's the business of medicine yeah and once you're saturated with that Mm -hmm. you don't care about you're good at the old ways Mm -hmm. if you should look up that phrase that Semmelweis boss told him we should look it up as a matter of fact if you want to look it up as a closure to this podcast we should read that yeah and the sentence look for um, what Zemmelweis boss told him to stop how do you spell it Zemmelweis do you want s-e-m-m-e l-w there you go cool same term yeah so there's look at there's even a paper on uh, PubMed about him. Oh my gosh, that is a sad quote. What is his famous quote? Similarly's famous quote. When I look back on the past, I can only dispel the sadness which falls upon my me by gazing into that happy future when the infection will be banished. It's pretty sad. That is that is what he said. Now let's read about what his boss told. To him what to do and what not to do. Actually, that should be somewhere. If you want, I can quickly type it. So what did the chair of Vienna Department of Zemel Weiss. Yeah. 
Young Klein. Yeah, that was the. So it is probably not going to be that easy to find, but um, that was actually a very interesting thing. So he practically tell him, stop, don't care. Nobody cares, okay? One of those stop while you're ahead type of. Stop, otherwise you will be in trouble. So and a threat? Just, yeah, it was yeah. a threat. He, but he couldn't. Semmelweis. I couldn't, couldn't even stop. imagine the this, the agony of sitting there knowing that you you have the ability to save all these people and you just can't. Like that that in itself would probably drive me crazy. Like just sitting there, like knowing, like something as simple as just throw your hands under some water with some soap, you know, and. That, that would drive me absolutely insane to have to be quiet. Or that's that's probably the definition of gaslighting. I bet yeah. he got <laughs> gaslit right that off. Is, that oh, is for sure. It's made like, like he was yeah. crazy. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. We can add it to the, the, to the, the comments, comments, yeah. comments section of that. And that was, but that quote should be in our podcast description as callousness of heart. Mm. But in the in the face of not figuratively, but literally people dying at ten times the rate mm. that if you just follow a simple advice, and that would be no harm to them to wash their hand. Right. It is really it is when you consider it shouldn't be really a big deal. You just wash your hand, even if you don't believe in that, it's not a any additional thing it's not really a big deal to wash your hand even if there is a two percent chance that that could be any truth in that mm -hmm. because the alternative is a tragedy yeah. that other people have to live with For this sure. callousness of heart is unbearable well we stay on a positive note it's 2023 and we have social media mm -hmm. people are smarter than ever we have a technology that brings this knowledge to patient mm -hmm. for them to look it up and uh, make decision for themselves. So um, we still have the same kind of mentality in many places, but uh, I'm hoping that it, it doesn't take as long as uh, it took Zemmelweis um, understanding to get acceptance for mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for listening. This is Essence of History. My name is Amanda Armagost. My name is Alyssa Haber. And I'm Dr. Abbasi for Essence. Have a good